to cover what I already see. You've got your reasons, but I hold yours. You've been on lockdown and I hold the key. Cause I loved you before you knew what was love and I saw it all still I chose the cross and you were the one that I was thinking of when I rose from the grave now rid of the shackles my victory is yours I tore the veil for you to come close there's no reason to stand at a distance in I want to thank you for joining us for the second week of Worship Moments. I want to thank the band for putting together the song uh, that you just heard and the song that you're going to hear. Um, we're going to start a new series this week. Um, as we start to begin to figure out who we are as Wesley, who we are as a church, and that's very much who we are. Even though we're a campus ministry and we exist in different ways than some traditional churches, I mean, we are a group of people who are the body of Christ. We are a church. And so we've got to develop what that means. We've got a lot of newness here. We've got not only the COVID crisis, we've also got a new director. Sorry about that. We've got a, a lot of new things going on here. And so I want us to, to develop what it is that we're going to be. 
who it is that we're going to be. Who is it that we're being called to? We need to look, I think, at the first church, the early church, and the church that exists primarily within the book of Acts and then after that in the New Testament. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to go over um, a few sections of Acts and, and just learn what we can and, and glean what we can out of, out of what the scripture tells us. Um, some of these are familiar stories and some of these are familiar passages and some of them aren't as much. I want to want to set our context for finding our new normal within the book of Acts. The disciples have had a little bit of a, let's say, yo-yo relationship with Jesus. Um, just as a recap, Jesus comes to earth. He calls the disciples at the beginning of his ministry. He says, hey, come, drop what you're doing, drop those nets, drop your job, drop your family, and come to me. And uh, in general, we like to think that's a good idea. But can you imagine the pain that the disciples were having? having to go through in following Jesus and having to give up their entire life to follow Jesus. And so we find the disciples who follow after this man who is then arrested and sort of put on trial and killed by the government and then is dead until Easter Sunday. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of the disciples on Holy Saturday, that day between Good Friday and Easter Sunday for just a second. Um, imagine the emotional toil of having a relationship with somebody like that who is then murdered by the government in front of you, I mean in public sight, and then is gone. And you have this hope that he's coming back again because he did foretell that he's coming back again. But on that Saturday, it's almost like you can't help but be worried and fearful about what's to come. I don't know if you've ever had a yo-yo relationship, and I think all of us have had something like that at some point uh, with a friendship or relationship or whatever, where something's really good one day and then really bad the next. And, and sometimes we feel like we're really close to somebody and then we're really far away. And, and a lot of times there's an emotional turmoil that can happen in the midst of those relationships. And that's kind of where the disciples are. In fact, at the beginning of Acts, Jesus rises into the heavens after having spent a few days with them being back from the dead. And so he rises into the heavens and all of a sudden where, where the disciples were following this man and then without him and then with him again, they now find themselves without him. And there's a, there's a bit of this back and forth that must have been emotionally draining for them. And then we find the probably the most famous passage of Acts, which is Acts 2. And this is the Pentecost story. Now here's what happens in Pentecost. Uh, it's the Pentecost holiday and all of the people, the people of God are gathered together and the Spirit is then in fused into the group. The Spirit comes upon the group in a big, real way, in a very tangible way, in which they start speaking in tongues. And, and it's funny because there's a lot of criticism of them. Are, are they drunk? What's going on? Uh, and, you know, surely if you were in that situation, you might have had some of those critiques too. And then Peter. Remember, Peter is the rock upon which Jesus builds his church. So this is super important that this is coming out of the mouth of Peter here. Peter stood with the other 11 apostles and he raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem know this! Exclamation point. This wasn't in the original text, but just imagine it. Listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk, as you suspect. After all, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And I want you to see what Peter does here. As he's about to defend what will become the church, he's defending this act of the Holy Spirit coming into the body. The first thing he does is he goes back to the voices of the prophets. I spoke at Monday Motivational a few weeks ago and talked about the voice of the prophets. I think we were talking about Isaiah at the time. But the prophets are, are a really important voice in the life of, of God's people. Not because they foretell the future, but because they tell the truth. And I want you to see what Peter does here. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions, your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. There's something interesting that Peter does here. Uh, the very first thing he says is, as the prophet Joel said, in the last days, God says. Well, Joel doesn't actually say in the last days. What Joel says is after these things. Uh, I mean, Peter is adjusting the language within here to say actually what he talked about, what Joel talked about, that's 
coming now. He is placing himself within the narrative, not for the future telling, but for the present. And so I want to invite us to think of prophecy not as some sort of future telling of some sort of magical making or anything like that. Instead, what if we could think of prophecy as truth telling? A declaration of what God is doing in the world, in our lives today. That's what's prophetic. When we talk about what we want to be as a church, uh, there are a lot of things that we would include in that, right? But first and foremost, I think, if we're going to define what our new normal is, in COVID and without COVID, first and foremost, I think it might be helpful for us to declare what God is doing as a matter of truth-telling. We need to be a prophetic voice. And I mean this in a big way. We need to be a prophetic voice within the campus of Florida State and Tallahassee Community College. There are people on our campus who are hurting. They may not even know it, but they are hurting to hear the good news that Christ comes to redeem all people. There are people on our, on our campus right now that I, I know for a fact have not yet found a community. They have not yet found a place with people they can trust and love and get to know. And it's our job to then reach to them and say, listen, we are here for you. Let us be a prophetic voice in your life to say God is on the move in this place, creating a community here. That is a truth. In a world that is so full of fakeness and lies and deceit, what if we were the church that told the truth about what God is doing here within our community? What I love most about Acts 2, uh, far more than even the Pentecost story, is the very end of the chapter. And it's just titled in a lot of Bibles, Community or Community of Believers. And, and it's interesting to me because when I first got to know Wesley and started talking to some of you on Zoom or whatever, the very question that I asked most people was, what is it that makes Wesley Wesley? In other words, why stick around here? Why be here rather than somewhere else? And they all said the same thing, community. And that's how Acts 2 ends. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. And a sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. And every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. The Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. Let's be honest, there was a lot of talk about growth in Wesley when I first got here. How are we going to grow as a community? How are, how are we going to expand our walls? How are we going to invite new people in? And, and within the United Methodist Church and frankly, most of Christianity within the American world, that's the question that's being asked. How are we going to invite new people in? And let me just suggest to you that there's two pieces. The first is the truth telling. The first is declaring what God is doing here and now, no matter how weird or strange it seems to the world. And number two, living in that community with each other. Have you ever noticed that when you have a community built on truth, it's healthy, it's vibrant, it expands? That's what God is inviting us to do in this place today.
so help me